Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Just Slap Tennis, the pound for pound number one tennis channel in the game. Your hosts, Steven and Alex, we have another special podcast episode for you guys. Guys, today we had the pleasure of interviewing Alexei Nesirov, my childhood best friend, played for University of Alabama, and is now an up-and-coming professional tennis player. He's going to make absolute waves on the Pro Tour, so get ready. That's exactly right. And if you are a player that has struggled with their mental game on court, this is the episode for you. So hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, join the Discord, and enjoy the podcast. All right, Losh, Alexei, thank you so much for coming. First of all, Stephen, I just want to, I just want to point out something. Mm -hmm. So this guy came all the way from California. He's got a futures potential. To, he's, you know, he's going to play tomorrow. We'll see if he gets in or if not. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but a big reason you came was to to get on the podcast and. You completely and, right. And uh, yeah. no, we appreciate you, Kevin. We Thank you taking the time and, and making the trip over because yeah. it's amazing to have you here. And so. I appreciate you having me here. It's uh, yeah, life is great. I'm super, super happy to be here. Just slap, you know, it's <laughs> amazing, right. amazing. And obviously I want to get in the tournament. I really hope I can get in. I'm getting closer yeah. and closer. We're, we're going to make some calls. They're going to get in. Yeah, please, <laughs> please do. I really need that. I need has got the connections as, as you probably can imagine. Any help, any help. Uh, but also I really wanted to come here, talk with you guys, share some life stories, things that have been happening to me because what's been happening is truly amazing. I'm just living my best life right now, truly. And actually I texted you because you invited me and I said that I'm going to come here only once I, once I'll make it there, you know, I'll walk the walk and then talk the talk. Well yeah. said. Well, so just to give some context, I call. I had a phone call with with Lyosha, Like, maybe we've been talking, you know, somewhat over the past like three, four months. But I think we had a call like four months ago or so. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, and when you're in New York, you should come on. And he was like, listen, I'm only coming on when I get to number one in the world because <laughs> because he had a complete. And and we're gonna get into we're gonna really delve deep into this, but. Um, I felt that from an external standpoint, I really felt like there was a complete mindset change yep. and it wasn't just like, Oh, I'm going to get to number one in the world. Like, Oh, I want to be number one. It was like, no, 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 bro. Like you don't understand. Like I'm getting to number one in the world. And once yep. I hit number one in the world, I'm going to come on the podcast, but you're here yep. and you've decided to, to not, you know, wait, wait until yeah, you hit right. number one in the world. So why, so what, ch what made the, the change? Why, yeah, why so the change in heart? Two reasons, two reasons. First reason is that I've always considered myself a perfectionist. I've always tried to be a perfectionist, always tried to be perfect. And recently I realized that's, that's something that, again, I thought it was something that was driving me forward that made me who I am. But in reality, it's something that has always been slowing me down in life and something that slowly but surely has been ruining my life in a way. Because, I don't know, I had so many insecurities because of that. I... I was afraid I wanted to, like, I don't know, go communicate with people, like just talk about stuff and everything, you know, but I couldn't do it because I was like, what if I say some, something stupid? Like I was never good enough. I was always trying to be perfect, but I was never good enough. And I always realized that, but who is, who is perfect? No one is perfect. And I didn't let myself do so many things or like just enjoy the life and do so many things that I wanted to do just because I've always tried to be perfect. And obviously I never was perfect. And Right now, I just accepted myself for who I am. I understand that I have some weaknesses. I have some insecurities, but I am who I am. Right now, in this moment, I'm sitting with you, guy. That's who I am. I, with you guys, I, that's who I am. I can say some stupid things, but that's okay. That's me. You know, I can't do anything about it. What I can do is I can grow. I can learn. I have today, tomorrow to learn something new, and every single day for the rest of my life to, to just become better and not necessarily strive to be perfect because again, no matter how good I am going to be at something, I'm never going to be perfect. So that's one of the reasons. Um, second reason is because I really thought that with this top, top secret book, weapon, the secret weapon, top secret weapon, that's my secret weapon because this is something that actually helped me feel the way I feel now, because for now it feels like I enjoy every single day, like every day, is a is a gift and I'm truly happy almost 24 seven. Obviously it's not like that. I still experience some negative emotions and I'm like, I've got this secret weapon. What if I share it with someone and it will stop me from getting to number one or winning the grand slams? Because I believe that I can do that. I truly believe so. I, I believe that I have all the tools, but obviously I, no one knows what's going to happen. Maybe <laughs> I'll walk on the street tomorrow, brick falls on my head. I die, you know, <laughs> anything can happen, mm. but I believe that I can get there with those tools. And so I'm like, what if I share those tools? 
that, that my secret weapon with everyone else and someone listens to that actually yeah. takes something away from it becomes better and stops me stops me from from getting there and what i realized is that tennis is not about for me right now it's not about becoming number one or winning slams it's not about the results obviously i want to do that obviously but i'm trying to really detach myself from that and tennis what tennis is about for me is about competing against the best of the best and if those tools help people become better tennis players that's great i want to play against the best tennis players right. wow. you know i want to play against the best tennis players and to me again i want to achieve all those things i will feel great but if i don't it's fine because again i'm just focusing on not on becoming number one in the world but becoming the best tennis player i can be and if i become number one in the world i'm not going to stop i'll keep striving to to be better and better and better and again i'm not going to be perfect for example Meditative, in my opinion, he became number one, number one, but he had a lot of imperfections in his games, you know, he still has a lot of room yeah. for growth, yeah. you yeah. know, and I, I believe he will grow. I, I hope he will grow. He has everything. And yeah, so that's that what changed then. So how you, you spoke about being a perfectionist. How did that um, how did moving away from from that affect your performance on the court specifically? Just giving myself room for mistakes and realizing that I can miss ball. I mean, everyone misses. Before, like my junior career, collegiate career, I'd make a mistake and I'd go go nuts. I mean, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like you've made that shot so many times in your life. Why do you miss that? Especially in an important moment. And I just completely, I did not understand myself as a player. I did not understand myself as a person. I did not understand my, my emotions and how they can affect me. How can, how can, how they can make me miss those balls. I mean, I just did not understand myself and I did not give myself any room for mistakes. Again, when you try to be perfect and just you see every single mistake that you make, every single imperfection. And I had a lot of good qualities. I had a lot of weapons in my game. I was I I believe I've I've not always been a good player, but I had something that you've, I could you've use. always been a good player yeah like I, I had something I could use but I did not see myself for those things mostly I saw myself for the imperfections that I had for the things that I was doing bad and now I'm seeing myself myself for all the good things and but at the same time realizing that yes I have some weaknesses I have a lot of areas to improve on but I can't do anything about those areas right now I can just again every single day just try to get a little better and that's it it's yeah. it's interesting because I've so just to contextualize this whole relationship, Losha and I have known each other since we were what five years old. Yeah, you actually taught me a really important lesson. Huh? <laughs> okay, very but important lesson. I don't know. I don't know what that's I. A, no, that's I mean, a first. Just, that's yeah. it is a first. Which I didn't understand until like a few weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. so we've known each other for forever. I mean, we started in the same group together playing tennis. Uh, yeah. You exponentially increased as, as I just <laughs> slowly... Because I was actually yeah, in a different yeah. group. I was Alex was going like <laughs> sideways <laughs> off the turf. They were like, well, Alex, what about, are you... Yeah. Th that's not tennis, but That's <laughs> not tennis. You're playing hockey over here on the court. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> um, no, but we've known each other for a very long time. Yeah. And it's... it's um, you. I, one thing that I remember, and this is one thing that always made you very good, but also was a weakness in some sort, was... Mm -hmm you were always extremely hard on yourself. Yeah. And it was like, it was to the point where, you know, sometimes it would make you an incredible competitor, but if things weren't going your way, it could be completely detrimental to you. Yeah. There's actually one uh, an interesting story that I want to kind of inject. There was a time where we played each other in a final. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my God, crying. Do you remember that? <laughs> we of played course. each other in a final. It was junior <laughs> tennis, so the sets were to four, uh, and it was best of three, right? Yeah. Um, he wins the first set, I'm crying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sobbing, Stephen. I'm I'm talking like sobbing, sobbing. Then things start to change. Somehow I win the second set. He's sobbing. But I'm just going nuts. Sobbing. <laughs> so my, our moms are watching together. We're best friends, by the way. They're like they're like we were like training together. We yeah. were to, like we would hang out all the time. We're crying. Like everyone's like losing. Their <laughs> exactly. My, our moms are like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. And then in the third set, it was a tight third set, I think, if I remember correctly. And both of us were crying at the remember. same time. Yeah. <laughs> so we were on changeovers, crying at the same time, asking our Poor moms kids. to help. Like, Poor kids. It was, anyway, it was oh, fun. This but we sport. Were, but yeah, you were, I, from an external standpoint, I remember you were always, um, always very hard on yourself. Which, again, was a positive in many ways, I'm sure, because it made you a better competitor. But also... 
but also could have been, you know, at times, obviously detrimental, uh, whether it be mentally or, or, or whatnot. So you don't recommend crying on changeovers just to make it clear? Uh, sometimes. sometimes. Sometimes it's sometimes. okay. It means you care. It means, you, bit, care. It means you care. A little bit. Okay. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so I want to jump but, into this to tap. Yeah. I want to go deep dive. Yeah. I want to teach me everything. Yeah. Teach okay. me everything. What's tap? And I have, I, and I just have it here. I, you, we, you wrote a quick outline on the tap, so I want to make sure we hit all the points. So I have it over here just in case. But let's let's do a deep dive into tap and and what it's about and and how is it yeah. how has it changed your life and and what are the what are the tools? Teach us the tools. Yeah. Well, so first, I want to say how I got to tap. Basically. Okay. So yeah, I got to the uh, first time I got to the yes was. Uh, when I was 17 or so, to the Wild Tennis Academy in California, my friend recommended it to me. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met my current coach, actually, Juan Jose Clement, mm -hmm. Spanish guy. I absolutely love him. He He's the one who created TAP. So basically it says, build your own man program. It's a it's a uh, book or a manual that helps you build your own mental program. And, and yeah, I mean, there, we had so many good stories from, from juniors with, with Juan Jose, but even though I was in college for five years, we maintained that bond that we we created um, when I was there as a junior. And he he's a big reason, and TAP is the big reason why I came back to the academy. That's where I practiced when I was still Wild Tennis Academy, a great place. Uh, and yeah, I just, when I was in college, I, I heard that he created that, that book. And the way I thought of it back then, I didn't know how it looked and what it was like. I thought it would as something that you like really read, you know, like just gain some information from I'm like, wow, Juanjo, wow. Because for me, like writing a book is something was something that I could never do for sure. And I didn't imagine Juanjo as a writer either. And so like, wow, that's impressive. That's interesting. But when I got, once I got to the academy, I actually was introduced to that manual and I looked at it at first. I'm like, it's so simple. There's no, it's not like you, it tells you what to do, or it's not like you read something, you gain some information. It just basically gives you a little tools, little things that can help you. For example, uh, right away, we tried to create my, my vision. So Juanjo told me that you need to understand what you want to become or who you want to become as an athlete, as a tennis player in two, three years or so. And you need to really think about it, go deep and, and write it down. Like, how do you see yourself in two, three years and what, what type of athlete you want to become and make sure that you, you write it in a present, uh, um, not present sense, uh, present tense, pre yeah, <laughs> present tense. Yeah. You see imperfections. Go, let's go. <laughs> got better, got better, got better. <laughs> write it in the present tense because you need to kind of train your mind that this is who you are. This is who you are, even though you're not there, but this is who you are. So building a vision Then he told me the importance of the routines. And again, that's something that you write in the manual. You have to write morning routines, night routines, post pre practice routines, pre match routines, post match routines, because this is something that I never really was taught to do the routines. I, what, what are the routines? I mean, I understood the, the routines, but like, I never understood the importance of the routines. And so those morning and night routines, they, they completely changed my life. And I asked Juan, Juan, what do you do in the morning routine? I don't know, but, or night routines, because for, for example, at night I would just <laughs> watch some TV show or something. I would sometimes fall asleep with my laptop not healthy at all for, for, for athletes. Like you shouldn't do that. You should try to avoid electronics. And he told me that he, he writes, he, he reads, he does meditation, he does affirmation, visualization, and he does some mobility and stuff. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll start doing those things. And I realized, and again, at, at first I was like meditation, visualization, like I don't know anything about that. Can it actually be that helpful? And I was a little skeptical about it, but then I realized, or now I realize that all of those things, all of those things, they make you think about who you are and understand yourself better, your feelings better. And little by little, you're like, okay, okay. I, I feel this because of that. Or, okay. I, I want you just, yeah, you just understand yourself better. I can go a little bit deeper into each one of them because I think each one of them is, is important. So Meditation, for example, I don't know. I'm not an expert in meditation. I'm sure like there are a lot of books and everything, but the way I understand meditation right now, I've been doing it for three, three months now, every single day is that, for example, I, 
there's one meditation that I do, monkey mind, monkey mind meditation it's called. Why it's called monkey mind? Because when you try to focus on your breathing and then just thoughts, they just mm-hmm. keep popping in your head. Just mind. And you try to really just focus on breathing, but you, you can't just stop your mind from thinking. And you're like, okay, okay, what am I thinking about? And it's not like you're trying to get rid of those thoughts. You have to accept those thoughts because that's what happens on the t- tennis court as well. You know, you just, you get those thoughts unconsciously almost and and you're like if you don't know how to control or if you don't accept them you start getting another one another one it's like a snowball and so what meditation does it really helps you understand that subconscious mind in a way and it helps you understand that yes like there there are going to be thoughts that are going to be popping into your head some random completely random like when i was doing meditation I was remembering some things that I experienced when I was seven years old or like 12. And it was just some random things. I'm like, what is happening? You know, Mm -hmm. but instead of like telling yourself that you're doing bad again and you're, you have to focus on breathing and why you're thinking about all that, you have to just accept it and try to understand your subconscious mind in a way you're like, okay, okay, this is what I'm thinking. Okay. And you just started understanding yourself better. Now, uh, visualization. So what that do, it creates just a, a clear picture for your mind what what do you want to who do you want to become and a little by little every day you do that and you start seeing yourself and your mind is like okay it starts believing that okay i'm i'm that person even though you're you might not be and at first when you say that you're like am i uh i don't i don't feel like i am you know but little by little you start seeing changes and you're like, it actually works. So let me ask you a question. So about visualization. Yeah. So when you say visualization, are you referring to visualizing yourself as number one in the world? Or are you referring to visualizing yourself with certain qualities? Yeah. What's the, is it like? Very good question. Very important. So for, for everyone is going to be different. Like you, there's no perfect way to do it. For me, I try to put only things that I can control there. Only controllables. Because, well, am I going to be number one in the world? I'll try to do my best, but is it really controllable? Not, not fully controllable. I only try to put things that are within my control. And for example, I don't know, I start my vision with saying that I love and respect the sport, not only for the good things that come with it, but most importantly for the tough ones. And, and yeah, again, not hundred <laughs> percent maybe controllable, but, but but I start believing that little by little, I start believing it because you have some tough losses and it's part of the game. You have mistakes. It's part of the game. And even though they're or like kids or like guys cheat, you know, like anything, injuries, but that's part of the game. And once you love and respect the sports only for those tough things, for tough moments, that's when you really start enjoying it much, much more. Because again, it's, it's just part of the process. Now... The next one, self-talk, and this is something that I combine together, visualization and self-talk. So I tell myself a sentence and then I try to vi- visualize it. I say another one, try to visualize it. But self-talk also is something that not that I only do in the morning, like for 10 minutes, but something that I really try to um, be a little bit more mindful of just throughout the day, because I realize that there's so many times when I have a negative self-talk that works against me it doesn't help me whatsoever and i've seen it with a lot of different players i mean when you say that oh i suck you know oh how could i miss that and stuff like that. it just it doesn't help you whatsoever you know and yeah i try to just be a little bit more mindful of that and and just really make sure that i i send myself uh, positive messages all the time even even if something goes wrong I always turn it into into positive message somehow. Like I, I don't know. Again, I miss I missed the ball. I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong? Okay, analyzed it, learned from it. Okay, good. That was a mistake that I learned from. You know, it's something positive. I actually learned something from it. It's not, I just made a mistake. I'm like, what the heck? So can you tell me? Um, because before, where would your mind go in a situation like that? Right. Just so like, I made a mistake. I suck. <laughs> like, like literally so because I feel like a lot of tennis players suffer this yeah. is something that happens with a lot of tennis players you yeah. know you, there are these things where you ha- you have this self-talk on court whether you can blame someone else 
yeah. you can blame yourself and and say that this is just like I'm I'm terrible. Yeah. So, but and this is something that you went through specifically. Yeah. So I guess what's the where do you find that those differences? How does that how has that shaped you in recent so months? So right now I just I understand again I understand my feelings much much better. I understand why I feel certain negative emotions, and I recognize uncontrollable and uncontrollable things much better now. So mm -hmm. if my negative feelings or negative self-talk is caused by by something uncontrollable then i'm like okay can i do anything about it can i do anything about that the sun is too bright into my eyes or that it's too windy no i have to accept that i have to accept it okay that's it accept move forward do something that you can actually control if it's controllable and that's what causes the, ne the negative negativity some sort not necessarily negative self but negativity then i'm like okay what can i do about it what can i do about it and right away i do something about it and that's it and i don't think about it anymore right away i try to make a change right away and then i mean next tool is writing again never consider it actually i had a crazy relationship with writing before because in college i i absolutely hated writing it was it was miserable i hate the format and every time i thought about writing I just kept procrastinating and procrastinating. I just, I didn't want to do it at all. I was just like, no, I'm not a writer. But now I absolutely love writing. You know how they say from love to hate, there's one step. It was completely opposite for me in writing. Mm -hmm. Because now I started writing about things that, that I want. Just anything, literally, literally anything. What I experienced today, what was good, what was bad. Like maybe relationships, just any thoughts. I started writing about things and I started understanding myself better. My feelings, my emotions. And this is... All right, this is the book where I write, just regular notebook, nothing special yeah. about it. But like, if you look at it, there's just like, it's like book full of thoughts. Yeah. And that's when, when I really started thinking that, wow, it's, it's interesting. There's some really interesting ideas and I now I understand myself better. And this is like literally my transformation from where I was yeah. to where I'm, where I'm now. And that's when I first thought that maybe I'm even, even going to write a book actually, because again, before, I'm like, I'm definitely not a writer. If I can do anything, uh, or like, I can do maybe anything in life, but something I definitely can do is, is writing. I am never gonna be a writer. Yeah. And I thought that maybe once I make it there, I can, I can write a book based on that because it's super, super interesting. You have all your experiences, right? And it's like a, your entire journey is now written exactly. down on, on paper. You know, you know what's funny about that? So the, the juniors that I used to coach, yeah. um, a tip that I would always give them is to have their tennis notebook where yeah. it's filled with obviously uh, your short-term and long-term goals you want to accomplish and, and also, but also like a daily log of, of like, essentially rating yourself like yeah. what like how was your fitness performance how was your uh your your performance on court what was wrong with your practice what do you need to work on like, yeah. and i've always felt and even for matches like i would like i would like give them like a uh like a couple of bullets that i wanted them to focus on in, in one of their matches uh or, or or even or even like some um some motivational thing as well and i would literally have them like on the court on the changeover open in your know your, your notebook read it yeah. And it's amazing how, because that always worked for me when I was a junior, yeah. and it, it really works. It, there's something about actually physically writing something down yeah. and reviewing it 100%. that it, you're holding yourself accountable. 100%, 100%. And last thing, reading. Like, I've always wanted to read more, and I always made excuses why I didn't read. And nowadays, I read every single day. Um, and before, like, I was like, if I read five or ten pa pages, that's not enough. But now I'm like, I'll at least lead, read five or 10 pages, you know, yeah. something. 10 pages a day leads to 3,650 uh, pages a mm -hmm. year, you know, which is much more than zero, which I had not, I never had years like that, but I had close to zero, you know, which is pretty, it's not good, not good, but it just, it's made me understand the importance of little things and how little improvements, how I can, first of all, reward myself internally just tell myself that you, you're you're good good job for reading five pages at least how i can reward myself I can, how i can appreciate little things a little bit more and how it's not about this huge progress in one day because if you have a big goal that you're striving towards no matter what you do in one day it's going to be insignificant in a way you know no matter how much you do it's insignificant in comparison to to all the things that you have to do to achieve that and so what i realized that's it's about the small things. It's about small things. Every single day doing something to get a little bit better, a little better. And 
And yeah, that's for sure what those those tools have, have done for me. And it's yeah. it's also interesting about reading because reading so I I was never a reader and I think my junior year of college and senior year of college I started uh, my junior year I started reading or maybe it was sophomore. Anyway, in college I started reading. Mm. And um I set like a hard goal, a goal for myself to really kind of like almost like shock therapy type of thing where I just like shock myself into it and force myself to read a lot. And it's it's in itself reading is super meditative. Yeah. Like it it's amazing how it focuses your mind, it clears your mind, it it, it gets you, it calms you. Yeah. It's like it's very interesting because again, if you read just ten pe- like if you read just like thirty pages one day, yeah. you're not going to feel it. But over time, like you've said, yeah. over you know you keep, keep building on it. It's, you it just really learn something new. I mean, and there's unlimited amount of knowledge in the books. You can you can learn so much, and you can also again understand yourself a little better. And uh, recently, I actually read that book that uh, Robbie Weiss, my assistant coach at the University of Alabama, he's now at Clemson. He recommended me that book. He was a great player. He was NCAA champion. He played on tour, was 70 in the world, I believe, beat Landel, just a great player. So he recommended me this book and he was like, that's something that really helped me uh, throughout my career. And it's called How to Talk or What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. It talks about self, self-talk self and really made it very clear for me. It talks how like everything, all the information that we receive or we tell ourselves we can think of it as a programming, as if like our brain is um, is a code, is mm-hmm. a code in a way that, or or a computer, mm-hmm. a pr- c- computer that you program. So every all the information that we re- receive, it's like writing, you're writing or typing a code, or someone is writing for you that that code. Then, based on that programming, you base your beliefs. You start believing in something based on that. Based on beliefs, you form your attitude towards things. Based on your attitude, you form your feelings, and based on feelings, you make actions. Believe it or not, we make all the actions based on feelings, and not not in a way that, oh, I feel happy, that's why I'm going to do that. But we always feel like doing something because of how we feel inter- mm-hmm. internally, and we, we start doing something because, okay, I feel like this is right, or like, we feel something and we make a- actions, and it's just really reframed it in, in such a simple way but it really made me think that okay i have to i have to first of all control what what goes from from the outside world and not just i mean i always understood that not just believe that everything analyze it and stuff and not let someone else kind of take advantage of my programming because there is a lot of negativity people tell you that you can't do that you you shouldn't you like you can't become number one there's no way it's impossible or I mean all the negative things and especially as a junior or as a kid you don't really have the sense of who you are you don't know who you are you don't know what you can do and so sometimes you just start believing that because people around you tell you that so it's very very important as well and besides that what you tell yourself again how do you program your mind if you keep telling yourself negative things that's what your brain starts believing that's what your brain starts believing and yeah that's why again those things they they sound simple but all of them help you understand who you are help you understand your feelings much much better and and once you do that it's just much much easier on the court because everyone sees on a tennis court that external fight you know player playing against player competing but the most important one i think is the is the mental one what's happening inside of your brain because i believe that at least I've, I've been noticing with myself that there's two internal voices. One conscious, I can say anything to myself right now in my mind, and unconscious when it just random ideas pop up, some doubts. And what those tools help you do is they help your conscious voice <laughs> defeat the unconscious one in a way. Right. You know, mm-hmm. you make that little, that conscious one makes a little win against unconscious, and then you start believing, okay, okay, those tools are actually working for me. And little by little, conscious start overtaking unconscious, and and then unconscious in a way starts working for you too. Starts working. Obviously, there's still some moments where I doubt myself, but the more I work on my mental game, the less I have them. And and now nowadays it feels like conscious wins 99% of the time. And and I feel truly when I play in a court, I feel like nothing can touch me. Like mm. nothing can touch me. No, no matter what. What happens out there, no matter the negative external factors, it's fine. I can always 
turn it into something positive something yeah you you talked about one thing that's interesting is that um you know you talk about this idea that, that your mind is like a, a piece of is like a computer right yeah. it's like you're you're programming a software yeah um what's interesting is that you have obviously environmental factors that go in so self-talk you yeah. know what happens externally things like that but you also have the uh the nature aspect right the yeah. the what how your brain is programmed neurochemically for example yeah um and i know you have a very uh you've been focusing a lot on dopamine specifically you've been watching huberman yeah uh stuff like that so can you like talk a, yeah, about can, go, can you talk uh, about like what practices again. are you doing in order to also change your brain on a, on a neurochemical level too. Yeah, not, not that I'm, I'm doing any practice. I just understand much better how it works. Dopamine, dopamine, for example, I think it's super important. Something that definitely has helped me. And I never heard of dopamine in 24 years of my life before. But the first time I heard it, it was my coach who was doing a presentation for all the kids at the academy. And he said, he said about dopamine, how can it affect like us? In, in how can it affect us in many ways? How can we use it to our advantage or disadvantage? And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Like, I want to learn more about it. And I listened to podcast, Andrew Huberman. I listened to dopamine and I understood that this is something, the way I see dopamine is like a chemical that our brain produces and something that, first of all, can motivate, motivate us. It can also I mean, help us feel pleasure from doing things. And it's something that I never took control of. I thought it's, it's impossible. And obviously there are external factors that will control the level of your dopamine always. But it's something that I actually have a lot of control of. And how you can control dopamine is you create internal system of rewards. What I mean by that is that you reward yourself for, for doing something. You do something, you, you tell yourself, good job, good job. And you actually, you release, just by saying that you did something good, you release the dopamine, at least that's how I see it. And that's how I've, I've been feeling. And it's very important that your internal system of rewards is, is more, it has to be more significant than external ones. Because for example, if, if you want to win a tournament or I don't know, just achieve something, be number one and you lose and it's more important than, than just pleasure from playing tennis, just learning, then what it does is just, you, yeah, sorry, you increase the, when you play, you, you, your level of dopamine spikes because you're playing this game, you're, you think you can win, it's, it's right there, but then you don't get it and you're like, Crushes. you just crash, you just crash. But because those external rewards, which is winning right. more, yeah, they're greater, more significant Makes sense. Than, than internal ones. And for me now, again, that's why I'm, I'm saying like, I'm trying to detach from the results because the love for the game, my, the love for the game is unconditional. That's what truly matters. That's what, that's how I can control and use the dopamine to my advantage. I'm not letting it, not letting some external factors take, take control over it. You know, I'm, I'm controlling it as much as I can in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, makes and again, not an expert. Human can explain much, much better than I can but do. But this is what, how it's affected you. I mean, this is what you've been hundred percent for yourself. hundred percent. hundred yeah. percent. It's, it's been helping me and just understanding that again, those, those internal factors are much, much important for me than, than the external ones, um, or that they should be, that's how I feel that, that they should be more important than external ones and that how dopamine can affect that. That's something that's been helping me tremendously. Yeah. And it's interesting, <clears throat> especially for like, like training, because it's so, you have to, I feel, be so process oriented that you can't let your successes uh, kind of pump you up too much or let yeah. your failures drop you down too much. So it's yeah. like with this system of focusing on, uh, on the internals as yeah. opposed to the externals, you're kind of like chugging along on this, this, this range, right? Exactly. You're not allowing yourself to. Yeah. And that's, that's what happens, for example, with close matches, you know, sometimes just like one or two points mm -hmm. aside at the end. And like, if you win, you feel like, yes, I'm doing, I want that much. Great. You feel so pumped and, and you're just happy. But if you lose, oh, I'm terrible. I lost that much. It's just the difference of one, two points. It, you're the same player. Nothing changes. Yeah. You're the same player. Yep. But the way you feel about it is just completely different. And again, that's just, for me, I realized that when I put too much 
attention to those external factors, that's what happens. It, I feel terrible about myself when I lose. I feel great about myself when I win. Now I feel, I feel realistic about myself both ways. I, I try to learn as much as possible from each match. Obviously, I still get a little disappointed when I lose. Yes, I still, I'm still happy when I win. But it's not about winning and losing. It's really about just getting the most out of the match, trying to grow and learn from every single point, every single match, and just going, going forward from there. You know, wins or losses, they don't determine who I am as a player. And that, that was a big, big uh, change for me, for sure. So we see, so we are obviously have access to, or we see Lyosha sort of who he is now and yeah. post tap and, and things like that. Yeah. Right. But let's delve into your past, right? Yeah. The, the previous career. Let's see. I mean, let's, I obviously have seen this because I've uh, and not internally, but I've seen it externally just from afar um, over the course of your career. But let's talk about your junior career. Let's talk about your college tennis career because yeah. um, you know, Obviously, to get here, you've had to grow from somewhere. Yeah. Um, and and your junior and college career, I know there was a lot of struggle uh, there, which has led to this. Yeah. Uh, you, these realizations and these this, these growths. For uh, sure. You know this growth. So, let's 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 start talking about. Let's delve into junior career. Yeah, junior um, career. Um, first of all, how did I start playing tennis? Yeah. No one in my family actually plays tennis, and so or like no one in from my very close relatives plays. But you've tennis. got a. Yes. Beast of a family. Beast Let's of not, a family. Beast yeah. of a family. That's for sure. Uh, but how I got introduced to tennis is that my, my aunt, she, on a sister of my, of my mom, she moved to Czech Republic a long time ago and sometimes we would come visit them. And she has a daughter, my cousin, who is one year older than I am. And so we went there when I was five years old. She was six and she just started playing tennis. And I went to practice with her, with, with her once and I was just helping pick up the balls. Maybe I hit the most I'm like, wow, that's, that's super fun. And I told my parents, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to play this sport. And so, yeah, they helped me, my grandma, my parents, they helped me find an academy in Moscow and great coaches. I'm super lucky for, for the coach, the first coach I had, Nuri Gordon, and we, we had the same mm -hmm. coach. Um, yeah. And I just, I started training and I absolutely loved it. Obviously again, had some struggles and stuff, but. I loved it then playing tournaments, you know, just going to different cities first, playing nationally. Yeah. Didn't you, didn't the tryout when, because I was at the academy first before you, I yeah. think, and then you like played a tryout match with me, right? Exactly. That's what, that's the lesson. That's the lesson I wanted to talk about. me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we played a tryout match and yeah, I think it was, I don't remember you the beat sport, me. You beat but me. I think it was you yeah, relatively easy. Alex and still it, cries about it. Yeah. No, no, the, the thing is that that's the lesson. After the match, he comes out and my dad was there and he's like, Loja played, whoa, I'm like great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like this guy just lost so easily and he's happy. Like, is that even possible? Like, because I mean, for me, it was ridiculous. Like, how can you be happy after you lose? And and I never really understood that that lesson fully up until again few weeks, few months ago. Because it doesn't change who you are as a player. You can be happy for your opponent when he beats you. Mm -hmm. That's totally normal. It doesn't it doesn't change who you are, you know. And so, yes, they win the match. They beat you. Con congratulate them. You actually can be happy for them. You played a good match. You, your opponent beat you. That's that's awesome. And so that that was a great lesson that that you taught me. And yeah, coming back to my... <laughs> she was Look at yeah. job, Alex. She yeah. was like, damn. Yeah. She was like... Yeah. No, no, for sure, for sure. Was, it was... Um, it's it so funny, funny because he, whenever I beat Alex, that wasn't the reaction that yeah, I got. Yeah, I'd be... Yeah. I'd, I, it's just, it, that's know. interesting. M okay. Maybe, yeah, maybe you should rethink. Yeah. When he beats me in his dreams, that's what yeah. I learned. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so... Be yeah, careful. Just, <laughs> yeah, just coming back to the junior career, started start traveling around the cities, just around the country. Um just meeting new players, getting my first points. I mean, so exciting. And little by little, just going up the ranking. And my first big result was the Nationals 12 and under. Like, yeah, I mean, everyone wants to win Nationals. And I was, I was nervous, but I was super excited to play it. And actually, in the qu quarterfinal, that was probably the most <laughs> important match. And not the most important, but one of the most important matches of my career because I played my rival, biggest rival at the time. We played like 14 times. Every single tournament we played against each other. Pavel Kotov, who is doing incredibly well right now. He's top 100 ATP. And I 
before that match, I lost to him every single time. He was just mentally, <laughs> he was much stronger than I was. He was just getting in my head. Every single time he was getting in my head. I hated this guy. <laughs> I was like, I, I couldn't play him. And Nationals quarterfinal, <laughs> finally, <laughs> I beat him. I beat him, make it to the semifinal. And I ended up getting third uh, in singles. And we won with Dima, actually, the, my best friend, the guy that you had mm -hmm. in a previous episode. We won it in doubles. And... That was a first very like important and big result for me. The result that made me top 10 in the country. And, and yeah, that's where I was, I was like, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's keep going. And then little by little, I started, tra started traveling internationally around Europe. Again, getting, yeah. Tell us the, well, so you play tennis Europe's. So tell us the yeah. Tootsie Pass story. Yeah, so, so yeah, played against some amazing players like Tootsie Pass as well. And there was a tournament, I think it was for teens, uh, for teens and under. And I played with one of my friends against Titipas and Kotov again. <laughs> no way. Titipas and Kotov, that was final of the tournament. Great to tennis Europe. And first set, I think they beat us relatively easy. Second set, we, we start turning things around little by little. And his mom, Titipas' mom, great player, one of the best players. I think she was the champion of USSR. She was the, his coach at the time. And she was sitting up there and she started coaching him. And maybe she was coaching throughout the match, but, but referee didn't really see it. And she would say something and then she would go like this. I think she's like asleep. I think she's not even watching. And the referee... Yeah. Which, sorry, not to cut you off, but it's funny because it's like some things never change. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some things yeah. never change. But and go so, on. so the referee gives them first warning. And for the first warning, you don't lose the point. It's just warning. If you get a second one, that, that's when you lose the point. So not a big deal. Keep playing. Win the second set. Third set, tie break to 10 pressure is on every point matters you know and and it was eight all we win important point nine eight i think titi pass is about to serve titi pass is about to serve his mom says something again goes like this referee sees it second warning caught of titi pass point penalty. penalty game set match wow that isn't that so crazy. good and we were like <laughs> take it take, we'll take it. it yeah we'll take, take that. it that's take what, it were they furious uh yes they were first they were like it's unfair you can't do it on a match point which i mean sure but you can't really be coaching on a tennis court yeah. you know and that's wild that's such a funny story it was great yeah so you have great. a winning record on cc pass then uh yes i only played him <laughs> in doubles only <laughs> once we've played a lot of same tournaments together if we've interacted a little bit he probably doesn't remember who i am but uh i got to know him a little bit um but yeah i only played against him in in singles, I mean, in doubles once, mm -hmm. and that's it. So yeah, Europe, then started traveling around the world. And the highest uh, ranking in Europe was 13, then in the world was 150. So things were good. Things were good. I had some awesome results. I got to travel again, see the world, get to know a lot of players. It was good, but that's the bright side. There was a dark side to it as well. And that's very important to understand that, yes, I had a lot of things, but a lot of great things going my way, but at the same time, I didn't feel that the things were going well most of the time. I actually struggled a lot. And there were many, many, many moments when I was losing my on the tennis court. I was going nuts. I would go after the matches. I would throw my racket as far as I could. I would break rackets. I would be crying. The worst part is that after some matches, I told my parents that I want to kill myself. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. No kid should ever do that and obviously like I never really thought of doing that because because I was like if if I do that my parents like I just cared about my parents too much and I I would would have never even but tried. I mean those dark but just that I even the fact yeah. that Crazy. I even had my thoughts and I'm not the only one like that there are a lot of people like that you know I'm sure I've seen it I've seen it and it's just crazy yeah, yeah. no question so those those dark thoughts the the yeah. you know whether it be, let's say, suicidal thoughts, or if it's even throwing aggression and throwing a racket and, and you know, a, a emotional meltdown. Yeah. Were those because, like, what was the source of that? Was that because of pressure that you felt to perform and when you didn't perform? 100%, again, that perfection is just trying to do everything perfectly, just focusing on the results again, just focusing on the results, not appreciating little things, not seeing positive sides of myself, just seeing myself for the bad ones. And not being able to control your emotions completely. Not being able to control more. one emotion, negative emotion, led to another one. And it was like a snowball. And like, it could be 
oh, I missed a foreign. My foreign doesn't feel good, which is, again, you, you shouldn't really tell yourself, oh, my foreign doesn't feel good. My foreign is okay. I missed the ball. It's fine. I'm going to make the next one. Oh, my foreign doesn't feel good. Then you miss another one. Oh, my foreign really doesn't feel good. Now, another one, oh, I, I don't know how to make a forehand. I, my forehand sucks, you know, which I actually usually was with my backhand. <laughs> my forehand usually was, was my weapon. But even with my forehand, I had, I had ideas like that and thoughts like that. And it was just like a snowball. And then at some point, thought after another one, and you just feel like you're nobody and you can't do anything in this world. You just, you just yeah, you kill yourself. You kill, you kill yourself with those emotions. And again, it... For me, it was perfectionist in me and also, again, not understanding myself completely, who I am as a player, not understanding my emotions, what, what causes those emotions. What causes, because that's super important. That's the most important thing. Once you start understanding what causes those emotions, once, once I started understanding right now, that's what actually changed me, how I feel about myself. Because right away, I feel negative emotion. Why did that happen? Why did that emotion happen? Is it uncontrollable? Accept it. Move forward. Controllable? change it, move forward, learn something from it, try to do something about it, move forward. And it's not like I don't just let those negative emotions be there and sit there. I, I analyze them and I do something about them. And that's why I never have those snowballs anymore. And I haven't really proved myself in anything. I'm still like an unranked player. I know I have a lot of growth and a lot of room for growth. And I, I have a long way to get where I want to get. But, but I believe that that's something that's going to be helping me throughout my career. Well, 100%. What, what, uh, what made you uh, go down the college tennis path instead of just going pro right after, uh, right from juniors? Yeah, so great, great question. One of the things was always financial side of it. Um, my family never had that much money, not, not a wealthy family, just a normal family that actually... At least I felt struggled in a way a little bit supporting me. I was I was given everything I needed, but I always felt like I really don't want my parents to spend money on me on my tennis, you know. And it was a big, big, very, very important thing for me. And I realized that I'm not that good, really. I'm 150 in the world as a junior, good, but I'm not like one of the best ones. So I could try, but the chances are very low and. We don't really have the money. We don't, I don't have the tools. I don't have the resources to, to really do that professionally. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started thinking about going to college. And, and you were also always exceptional at school. I mean, you were. He, I yeah. mean, he, so both Dima and, and Losh, they both, um, in Russia, it's the Golden Star, right? That's, yeah. yeah. So in Russia, you get the thing called Golden Star. And it's given to students who since kindergarten to grade 12 have only gotten straight A's. Mm -hmm. And it's an extremely difficult thing to do, as you can imagine. I was out of the, the, the running my first grade, yeah. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine. No, but, but it's an extremely difficult thing to do. So you've, you've had exceptional grades. So school, I mean, yeah. you know, that's, I, I feel like that might have also played a reason as well is because it's like you've been an academic guy. For sure, for sure. For my parents have always told me that education is super important. Yes, tennis is, tennis is life, you know, like in Ted Lasso, there's a character who says football is life, coach. Tennis is life. But at the same time, I always understood that life is much more than tennis, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, I always understood the importance of education and I had good grades. Though, again, even though I had those good grades, I never thought of myself as a smart guy or genius. I always felt like, <laughs> not necessarily stupid, but there's so much more to learn. And I was, a lot of times I was afraid to speak up or like express my, my thoughts because again, I, I didn't very, really feel st smart about myself. And, and yeah, like, yeah, I had good grades. But I was getting grades for the grades, and not for studying, not for learning. I was getting grades for grades, and I was and pretty perfectionism. Exactly, guess, perfectionism. Yeah. Just, yeah, not really necessarily learning. And also, I need to give credit to my mom as well. She helped me a lot, a lot because I missed a lot of schools with with those turns. That's what junior players deal with. They miss school and they have to catch up and everything. And my mom was always there for me. She. She always helped me with all the subjects and she even did some homeworks for me, I'll be honest. Uh, so, yeah, yes, I had good grades, but it wasn't, 
it wasn't perfect again it wasn't perfect and it wasn't only me there was my mom behind it a lot as well and and my dad as well and so i never felt proud of it i everyone was telling me oh losha is smart losha got the gold medal i was like you don't know you don't know anything about it you don't know the the reality of it in a way we'll make sure to edit out that part about your mom doing some homework so you keep that gold medal yeah they're gonna come they're gonna come they're gonna come no but uh, they can take it away <laughs> no but i mean even i just remember like didn't you get an 800 on the math section for sat i did that i did that yeah and like actually, this guy yeah this guy okay <laughs> okay the sat by the way uh the first time i got to america my english was terrible yeah. and that's another reason why i felt it was it was very challenging for me my english was bad i i was afraid to communicate with people because again my english wasn't perfect how could it be and it's not perfect now clearly <laughs> even though it's getting there little by little um and so sat is something that i was very nervous about three sections reading writing and math reading and writing i'm like i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna fail <laughs> please please every point matters but math when i looked at it I'm like, this really? Is a joke. This is a joke. I'm like, really? You know, I, learned, we... I learned it in seventh grade. And I always thought that that's one subject that I always loved math. I love solving problems against very, very analytical type of brain and solving riddles. And to me, I was like looking at those problems. Like, I don't know, they give you 20 minutes for section. I would be done in eight minutes and uh, I would try to like go to another one. Actually, like you're not, you're not supposed to Just do look, that. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, what's, what's the what's next question? Next? Another going. question. Or I'm like in another section. And so going into SAT, I kind of, I knew I was going to get 800, even though it might sound arrogant, but I was like, I need to maximize that. But then my writing and reading was like 500 each, you know, which gave me 1800 out of 24. Right. right. Solid result in a way. But again, it was mostly math and not. No, that's, that's really funny. There's, there's a story I, and maybe this is, I'll, I'll say it, but. Um, we had a mutual friend uh, who was on, uh, played for Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy. Mm. And so I met Jeremy in the UK and when I lived there. Um, and it was a random thing. Like I saw them in a Snapchat story together and I was like, yeah. what the hell are you guys yeah. doing together? Like yeah. I was like, and Jeremy and I weren't like close friends. Like we played tournaments together and stuff like that. We were just tennis, you know. But anyway, um, very funny guy. And... Uh, he told me this story. I was with him, I think, a few like five years ago or something like that. And he told me a story um, where they were on the team together, and they were in accounting together. This was must have been like sophomore year of college yeah. or something. They were in accounting together, and Losha's tutoring him and helping him with his accounting homework. And he's like doing it, and Losha's like guiding him and stuff, and and he gets like ninety ninety five percent or something like that on the homework. Yeah. And Losha gets up and he's like, what? And he takes the computer. He's like, give it to me. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> and he does it in 10 minutes and he gets a hundred percent. He's like, okay, here you go. <laughs> Perfectionist. Perfectionist. It's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. I was laughing so yeah. hard. Man. But, but let's talk about college. Let's talk college. about college because college. one of the things that, um, one of the things that you said was, you know, college was the, the the best five years of your life but also the worst five years it was like a it True, was yeah. a very love hate yeah. love hate relationship <laughs> yeah. so let's talk about it let's let's delve into it how did you choose alabama roll yeah. tide let's get roll into tight. let's alabama, get into that yeah where legends are made from moscow russia <laughs> to alabama i mean it's yeah. it's yeah it's it's yeah it's so again i was the, at the academy uh, in california and actually i would really wanted to go to ucla or uc because they're right there and ucla is a great school big school and Max Cressy, by the way, he was there with me at the time in the academy, and he ended up going to UCLA. Mm -hmm. And he was the one when we were juniors. He was we, we spent a lot of time together, and he was the one who was telling like, yeah, we're gonna go to college, and then after that we're gonna go pro, and we're gonna make it. And I mean, he's he's already there, and we actually just trained together for a couple of weeks right before Australia, and he didn't change at all. <laughs> the same guy, the same guy. It's so funny how things never change, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, and so. I wanted to go there, but I couldn't get enough scholarship. They had a really, really good, strong team. And again, I wanted to, I needed to help my family as much as possible. They couldn't afford paying too much. So I needed to get as much scholarship as possible. And I started looking at other schools outside of California. And my coach uh, from the academy, not Juan, who another one, uh, he recommended me to look at Alabama. And at the time, 
I didn't know much about Alabama at all, to be honest. Nothing. I was like, what's Alabama? Where is Alabama? <laughs> and and I looked at it and I don't remember actually if, if the coach got in contact with me or I did get in contact with him, but, but we connected and he was like, do you want to come for a visit? I'm like, sure, let's go, let's go. But at, at the time I was like, I don't, I don't want to go to Alabama again. I just, I, again, I didn't know anything, but for some reason I thought it was middle of nowhere. And in some ways maybe it is, but it's actually a great place. So I came for a visit and I saw all those facilities. I'm like, wow, the football stadium, everything. It's, it's a paradise for athletes. I mean, pretty much every single major um, athletic program there is top 10. Football, basketball, uh, uh, gymnastics, uh, softball. I mean, anything. You look at any program, top 10 or top 5. And fo but football, obviously, is the biggest deal. Yeah. Pretty much every single home game, hundred thousand people in stadiums. You know? It's crazy! It's crazy! It's, it's, it's crazy! Insane. It's insane! And a lot of students, I've met a lot of students that go to the school just for football, just for the football, football games. or parties, or parties yeah. actually, because Greek life is very big there as well. But again, that's that's not what interested me. I just felt like I had everything to develop myself as a as a player and a person. I like the team, I like the coaches, and I was like, I like the place. I really I really want to commit here, and. I don't care about UCLA. We'll beat UCLA with Alabama. Unfortunately, never got to play them. Oh, that's uh, a bummer. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. But but yeah, so I committed there. And it seems, again, like perfect place. Why not? But as, as you said, five years, the best years and the worst years. And I'll tell you the reasons why, why I felt this way. First of all, going into, into college, I had a long, not long, yeah, long distance relationship. And I had a first girlfriend was mad in love, you know, like it was super important for me. And actually at the time I really was like believed in the idea of having like one girl for the rest of the life. And it was, that's how much important it was, was to me. But at the same time, I was immature in many ways and it was all new for me. Like the college, being on the team, it's not something that tennis players are used to. And again, just everything is new and kind of dealing with all of that and maintaining my long distance relationship. It was very, very challenging for me. And, and yeah, I made, I made a lot of mistakes and I hurt her. And because I hurt her, it, even though unintentionally, I, I hated myself for that again. I hated myself and I really struggled a lot. And in a way, again, I experienced a lot of great emotions because of the relationship. But at the same time, I struggled a lot. And I kind of lost the sense of who I am in, in that way. Then second thing, studying. I chose finance. Why did I choose finance? Why, why does anyone? Yeah, why did, money. Yeah, <laughs> why did I choose finance? I thought, okay, I like, I like solving problems. I, I have analytical type of brain. I like, yeah, I just, I, I love math and and in finance you have to work with numbers. I love working with numbers, so sure, let, let's try that. But in reality, through all five years of <laughs> my studying, I was like, why am I taking those classes? And I liked some of those, but I really disliked a lot of them and going into some of the tests like I didn't prepare at all you know like I didn't prepare at all I would go to the test and just intuitively I would be like okay that makes sense okay let's go this one nah 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 and somehow I would still get good grades 4.0 yeah I ended up with 4.0 but this 4.0 is so meaningless it's it's completely meaningless it doesn't mean anything because I felt like I wasn't really learning and again that was my fault I was I was kind of lost. I was trying to understand who I am, what do I want to do in life? And do I really want to do finance? Do I want to become an investment banker? Because I had that idea that as an investment banker, you, you're like, you're cool, you make money, you know, and you're great. But I didn't know if I wanted to do that. And I didn't know why I was taking those classes really. So for that, because of that reason as well, I was like, who I am? Then third thing, teammates, my team. I love my teammates. They're great guys, guys from all over the world. We learned so much from each other, had, a, had an amazing time. I feel like in a locker room, <laughs> everyone was always laughing and just doing some stupid things. You know, like how, how teams are. Helicopters, Ricky would know what it is. <laughs> yeah, I just, think we uh, all do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we all know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll cut that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe we'll leave that. Ricardo. <laughs> Yeah. With the names. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because when we were talking about the things we were talking about in this podcast, I didn't see helicopters, <laughs> see helicopters on the, on the yeah. list. Yeah, that's hilarious. I mean, <laughs> it's 
pretending as if it's some like no one knows anyway yep. okay but at the same time <laughs> like i always wanted to develop that sense of family but at the same time i didn't really feel like family with them and the reason why is that i realized that i was i was struggling and then i saw some other guys struggling with some things and i feel like we didn't really take those things seriously again it was all in a way for shits and giggles you know and which is which was good again that's what made us a fun team in a way but we didn't take care of each other really how the family does it and it was my fault in a way because i was assigned to be a leader after the first uh, my freshman year by, by the coach and honestly i wasn't a good leader i did not speak up when when i felt like some things weren't going the right way and I could have done much, much, much more. And I mean, there were two guys, me and, and Edson were leaders after the first uh, uh, year. And he was much, much better leader than I was. And so again, again, kind of like great, great time with, with the guys. But then there's also some things that really make me feel like things are not going the way I want them to go. So I know I know you were you were struggling, right? Yeah. Again, emotionally, right? the long distance relationship that was yeah. on your mind then you yeah. also had the tennis i mean you weren't playing your best tennis and and you would kind of because you were perfectionist because you were in a more negative mental state you would dig yourself into a deeper hole yeah. so are from what i understand the fact that it was a team environment the fact that it was kind of in gigs all the time it was no one actually took the time to yeah really see what was going on and try to help you yeah get out of that hole for sure for sure i mean i i thought that it was pretty clear that i was struggling and again i could have s explained them better but it wasn't very easy for me i always consider my myself introverted person and it wasn't easy to to share that with them so i could have done a better job but also i thought that they could have seen it a little bit more that yeah this guy is struggling we need to help him a little bit more and again, great guys. I love them. I love them. And it's not to take something away from them or not to say that they're bad. Not at all. But it just, it just again, happened that way. Yeah, it yeah. just happened that way. We, we all made mistakes. And it, again, it, it was far from uh, great. You know, like it was it was good. But again, I didn't never got a sense of a family, which I really, really wanted, which was very important for me. Then another thing, relationship with the coach, super important. Um, my coach, George Husak, great guy. He, we always had a good relationship outside of the court. He helped me with a lot of things, helped me with uh, getting a job. And I mean, a bunch of things. We shared a lot of personal stuff. But on court, we, <laughs> we didn't get along very well. You know, like we disagreed on a lot of things. We, we fought a few times, had some heated exchanges. And I think, again, I could have done a much, much better job. Um, I had an ego in a way like that. Yeah, I know better sometimes, you know, what he says doesn't really make sense. I know better. It doesn't work for me. And I believe he had an ego as well. And he was like very, in a way, it felt like he was a superior and he was demanding some things sometimes. And I feel like there is no place for an ego, for an ego in coach uh, player relationship. I believe that it's a two-way street where two have to absolutely respect each other, have to listen to each other, and both make each other. Player make a good coach, coach makes a good player. And it was just two egos colliding, and we definitely weren't helping each other. And there was one, there was one hidden moment, I'm not going to go into details, but one moment where uh, it was my junior year where I realized that, okay, I'm, I, can't, I can't deal with that anymore, and I actually wanted to transfer. I was in a transfer portal. Um, then ended up actually staying uh, for certain reasons. Uh, maybe I'll talk about it later uh, because it's related to my grandma. Um, but but yeah, it was it was good. That relationship was good in many ways, and it's still good. We maintain a good relationship. He texts me. He just yeah, we 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 we're we're, <laughs> we're good. We're good. Not it's not like our relationship is bad. But there there was tough moments. There well, sometimes was, yeah, there were really tough moments. Yeah, like you said. I mean, if 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 it's two people colliding, it's impossible to yeah. grow. I mean, it's like, because you're, yeah. you're not focusing on the common goal. You're focusing on how do I, you know, yeah. you're basically focusing on trying to beat each other out on who's right, you know, or who's, who's yeah. ego. Yeah. And the biggest thing about my relationship right now with my coach, Juan Jose Clement, is that I feel like 
I stripped away my ego completely and he doesn't have an ego either. We respect each other completely. We listen to each other and we just, again, we both learn from each other. We grow together. And to me, it's a, it's a again, perfect, <laughs> almost perfect uh, relationship, coach player relationship where we both grow and learn. And it's, it's, it's awesome. And then lastly, uh, obviously I'm in tennis, tennis. I, I completely lost the sense of who I am as a tennis player. Some matches I'll be just pushing balls, you know, just trying to make the ball in some matches. I'll be ripping balls and making everything or just, I was just, I didn't know who I was on the court. So, and, and at the same time, I had some incredible moments where I clinched matches and, and it felt great. It was so awesome to, to do that. And to me, actually one, one important thing that, uh, I think it's important to mention is that I always struggled playing on the team in a way that I always consider myself a selfless person. And to me, team became much more important. Like I didn't really, I wasn't playing for myself in a way, which I think you should never forget about You You should play for yourself. It's good. But I was playing for, for the team. And, and that's something that made me, like gave me so much pressure. I really, I was like, if I lose, if I lose, I let the team down. If I win, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, like I'm supposed to win. I, I, like it would be great. I need to help the team. And I played for the team. I played for the coach. I did not play for myself. And that's why I struggled a lot. That's why I lost myself as a player as well. I didn't really, yeah, I didn't focus on myself enough. I didn't focus on, I focused on helping the guys, like really being as supportive as possible. And I forgot about myself and I didn't have the right tools again to do that, to deal with that. And, and yeah, and the last thing, actually last very important one as well. I mean, I think it's, it's quite important parties and alcohol so i did not drink until i was 20 i don't not one sip and i think it has it has something to do with my dad because when i was six seven he would let me try anything he was like if you want to try i tried something like what or something just a sip oh, oh, oh that's terrible that's terrible and that's maybe I, why i didn't like it but something changed so first two years freshman sophomore did not drink at all and again alabama is a party school team party partied a lot as well everyone parties there <laughs> and i went to some parties but again introvert felt very introverted didn't drink i was like what am i doing here i didn't really have fun but then it, it changed a little bit i went uh, back to russia for the summer break and i was like let's try it let's try it let's try it and and i was with my one of my best friends with uh Slava, another guy, and he's that guy, actually, he's a great guy. So we drank together for the first time. I was like, wow, that was so fun. That was so fun. And so when, when I came back for my junior year, I'm like, boys, I'm in, I'm in, That's so funny. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in. And, and the re and the thing is, again, we had great time. We had a lot of amazing parties and stuff. It was awesome. But I realized that, yes, I was drinking to have a good time and I had a good time, but I was also drinking to kind of lose myself again, to just forget about the problems. So, you know, I would wake up next day, same thing. It was fun, but next day, same thing. So I, ha I had to deal with the same stuff. So it wasn't very healthy in a way. And again, it's not like I was drinking like crazy, not at all, but it's not like I would have a few, few drinks and I would just feel tips and have fun. I was like <laughs> really going for it, going for it. And a lot of, a lot of uh, kids do that at the University of Alabama. That's that's how it is. And I just, again, did not. I don't think it helped me and it was it was beneficial in any way. So, yeah, there are a lot of things, a lot of things that were making it super fun experience that made it best years of my life and made it the worst years of my life in a way. I just, yeah, I struggled a lot. A lot. So let's talk about uh, post-college tennis then. Yeah. Because um, I know that they're, you know, you weren't sure what you wanted to do for a long time. You, you studied finance. You got a master's, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, and so... COVID year, yeah. <laughs> COVID year, you got master's. Yeah. And so you were thinking, okay, am I going to pursue investment banking, which isn't something that you wanted to do. It, it sounds yeah. like it's something that you felt like you kind of had to do or, or yeah. it was like, you know, it's not, it didn't feel like yeah. authentic from what I understand. Yeah. What made you want to pursue professional tennis? So what, what was the click in the head where you were like, you know what, I'm going to go for it? Yeah. So again, let's, let's start from the very beginning. Like after, after college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to, in a way, buy some time. And I also didn't really have any money. I needed to support myself in some way. And so I got OPT, uh, which is optional practical training, basically work authorization for a year. Um, and I started working, I started making some money and, 
And yeah, I was trying to save money so I can have some uh, resources to support myself if I uh, start pursuing professional career because I was I still wanted to do that. I, I never lost that belief that I can achieve something big in tennis. And I don't think I will ever lose it because I know my grandpa, grandma will talk about it. Uh, and yeah, that was that summer before I made the decision. That was last summer or actually, yeah, last summer, last summer, summer 2022. It was perhaps the most challenging summer for me because that indecisiveness, it was killing me. I was, I was like, what do I want to do? Am I going, am I going to leave tennis and go into investment banking and try to do something there? And the way I thought of it is that I believe that I could achieve something big there. I could start making a lot of money. Like I would get there again, glass half, half full, not mm -hmm. half empty, but I would have to struggle. I'll have to struggle because again, you can't really be an introverted person in investment banking. And I didn't really like finance. At least that's what I thought from the five years that I've studied. And so the only reason I wanted to do it is money, really just money. Um, yes, I obviously I would have learned a lot and I thought it would be cool to be investment banker, but there was nothing behind it really other than money and being able to support the people I love myself and, and everyone. And then tennis is something that I've always or professional tennis, something that I've always dreamt of doing. And I've always that had that kid inside of me who believed that everything is possible. You can achieve that. But at the same time, I realized that who I am now I'm in, in terms of tennis, like I'm really no one, like no one knows who Alexi Nestor is. He's so far from, from getting somewhere in tennis and the chances are so slim and I don't really have much money still. I don't have support, financial support. So is it realistic to go and try? And so every single day I was thinking about it. It's like 24 seven. Do I do this? Do I do this? Sometimes I would lean towards one option. Sometimes towards another. I had some interviews. I tried to get a job and I don't know. It was just, it was so bad because I, I could not make a decision. And yeah, it, it was, it was, it was very, very challenging. And then at some point I was like, I don't know exactly what, what made me do that, but I was like, I just need to follow my dream. I just need to follow my dream. I, I have to, like, I have to make a decision. And I made a decision. It only took me a long time. I should have made it way, way earlier. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to follow my dream. I'm going to do everything possible to give myself a chance because I never gave myself a chance to, to play professionally. Something I've dreamt of, but I never gave myself a real chance to play professionally. And so I'll give myself everything, like all the chance, not all the chance. I'll do everything possible to, to try to do that. If it doesn't work out, I'll figure it out. I'll go from there. I'll go from there. Did you give yourself like a time? line or was it open I, w I was thinking about that but then i think the timeline would put too much pressure mm -hmm. in a way and yeah i, I don't have a timeline i like that yeah. i like that a lot yeah, yeah i don't have a timeline um again i'm trying to stay in the moment right now get the most out of what i what i have and i have i feel like i'm i have a lot i'm very grateful for all the things that i have again living my best life honestly i feel like i'm living my best life even though there's struggles and challenges i'm dealing with those challenges much much better now and truly i almost feel like i'm happy 24 7 living my best life feeling much more confident and and i see so many improvements in my game and everything in my mindset and just in other parts of life i'm just enjoying li life much 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 more and well, it's amazing because it's like even let's say you know the fact that you made this decision to pursue professional tennis mm -hmm. The fact that you went to, you know, you met your coach, uh, Juanjo, right? Yeah, Juanjo. Um, yeah. The fact that you reconnected with Juanjo and your training together and the fact that you've had exposure to TAP and you've started implementing these tools. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, you never know what happens. Even if tennis doesn't end up being the thing that you pursue, like, yeah. full-time, like, if, the, if you end up getting a job or, or whatever. Yeah. Like, I feel like just this journey that you've had yeah. so far yeah. has done so much for your personal growth and yeah. personal development. 100%. That it's it's changed your life and trajectory, whichever way you go in the positive. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Which is amazing to see. Yeah. Like for example, about interviews, I've always been afraid of interviews. Now I feel much more confident. I feel like I can show my personality. I can talk. I can speak. I can be much more curious about other. Because right. before that, I was like, don't say anything wrong. Don't say anything wrong. Don't ask any questions. Just I never ask questions. When someone asks you, like, do you have any questions? I was like, 
No, I think I, I think I got everything, mm -hmm. which is terrible. You you have to ask questions, but right. I was afraid to say something wrong or ask something wrong. Now I don't feel this way at all. I'm much more curious about people. I I really try to speak up more and just I'm much more extroverted. I can be as extroverted as I want to be, right. just like completely open book, and I can be as introverted. And I feel comfortable and confident both ways. Right. And right. it's it's a big big change for me, and that's what makes me feel this way what makes me appreciate life much more now i'm just it's completely like i feel like a completely different person that just happened in three months and yeah even if again it doesn't work out for me in tennis i'm reading much more i'm just learning much more i'm still there's much more to life than just tennis even though i devote a lot of time to to the sport you know much more to life and much more i do much more than just tennis right now so whatever happens happens i'll just keep focusing on me keep trying to get better every single day and go from there go from there oh, that's yeah. that's incredible i mean that's what matters yeah. um let's talk about i know i know because you mentioned it earlier yeah. but you decided to stay in alabama because of your grandma and i'm assuming yeah. so for context your grandma was a i mean i i think i've only met one of your grandmothers if mm, i'm probably this one yeah yeah so she was an olympic champion mm -hmm. um and, and gold, medal. gold medalist yeah, yeah. Um, which is insane. So, I mean, let's talk about how, and maybe just br more broadly too, like how family has impacted your tennis journey. Just yeah, grandma, my my family just in general has always been very athletic family. They always do something for their health and like either whether it's running or or anything. But definitely, my grandmother was always has always has always been the person who achieved the most in sports. I mean, winning Olympic gold medal, <laughs> what can be bigger than that? And she is the reason that I've always believed that it is possible. Like I've always believed that if my grandma can do it, I can do it too. And she was, she was incredible. Like she, she was very strong. She, she was very outspoken, just like trying to do great things for people she did definitely did a lot of great things for me she helped me again find the academy uh, actually there's a <laughs> very funny story when she came to some of my matches and she used to or a couple of times she screamed loja te luchi which means like you're the best you're the best at the time again introverted guy in a way i'm like what are you doing grammar <laughs> <laughs> like don't don't say that and now I, I i wish i wish she could be there and and doing that because she she passed away and actually as as i said she was the reason i stayed but really the reason was that she she passed away and it was it was very unexpected she it was a tough moment she she got hit by a car uh, could have lived for way much much longer i thought and it felt very unfair i'm not gonna go too deep into details about that but that was the moment when i was going through like all that stuff junior year when I was trying to transfer I was in the transfer portal and I was trying to find a different university and the coach coach actually um, oh no my I just got the news about my my grandma and it was just that was the per first very important person that ever passed passed away uh, in my life and it was it was it was really hard to accept she was very very important to me and and I was like, what do I do now? What do I do? And, and the coach, he texted me. He didn't know what happened. And he texted me. He asked me if I can meet him and talk to him about transferring. So we meet the next day. He still doesn't know. And he sees that he, he was trying to convince me that I should stay. Or not convince me, but like try to talk again and ask me if I really like want to transfer. Maybe it would be better for me to stay. And I was, we just had a normal conversation, but he's like, is everything okay? Like you seem very down. And I'm like, yeah, my, my grandma passed away. And we talked a little bit about that. And I'm very thankful for him because he, he actually helped me with the tickets. Um, he, or university helped me with the tickets because tickets were super expensive and the funeral was in a day or two. And I flew, I flew right away to, to the funeral, left everything. And, um, yeah, after after he helped me with that and 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 yeah it's just the I, I i couldn't think about transferring anymore and stuff and i was like i'll just stay here i there's actually good things about the universe i can still grow and get the most out of it and that's that's the way 
it affected me you know like not not a positive not that she had a positive of, right. effect or not that something she said something uh, right. sorry but, just yeah yeah but it seems like i mean it seems like she is very much the the force that is still driving 100 percent. so i mean so it's like it's almost like it, it seems like it, when she passed away what happened is that i i realized obviously like i'll never see her again i'll never have her in her life but it was something very important i actually went for a run because i didn't know what to do so i went for a run and i was like running and and crying and running again running again and crying and i realized that yes yeah, she she might not be with me physically but like she'll forever be in my heart right. you know Absolutely. like she'll always be a big part of me and she will always serve or not serve but like drive me and be be that driving force that will move me forward and she 100 percent moves me forward like never before like never never before and yeah i mean i as a kid i've always imagined that i would win the olympic games and for tennis players usually grand slams are more important you know and for me it's like olympic games i want to yeah. win olympic games for my grandma and i always imagined she would be sitting in the stands and she would be <laughs> maybe screaming <laughs> no, you're the best. The yeah you're the best you know and obviously I realized I would never have a moment like that, but but I still want to do it for her, you know, in a way, even yeah. though she obviously she's not going to see that. But that's something that truly, truly matters to me and means a lot. And that's something that drives me forward. It's not not those again, not the wins, but just the love for for my grandma and just. Yeah, that's amazing yeah, so much. It's that's yeah. an incredibly powerful. Yeah, just the fact that it's yeah. so much deeper than just uh for sure and that's something know. that when, whenever i had doubts in my head whenever i was like maybe i should just stop playing because i had a lot of moments when i was like i just should stop playing that's i think something that kept me going every single time that that belief that i can do it that that i can do it just like my grandma did that's something that made me go and go and go and actually one very important lesson i learned when i won the national section 16th and under and I became the, the national champion. I was like, wow, that's, that's really good. Cool. I w always wanted to do that. I was number one in the country and everything. But then the next day, I was like, so what? Yeah. Life goes on. Right. So what? Mm -hmm. So what? And Which must have been tough. Yeah. Because when you hit something that you really want to hit, and then it's like... Exactly. And, it exactly. and I realized like, that even if I become number one in the world or I'll become Grand Slam champion, it will be so what? And so I remember talking four months ago or so to my coach, Juan, and I'm like, Yes, I want to become number one and Grand Slam champion and all that, but that's it's not about that. It shouldn't be about that. It's it's bigger. It has to be about something else. And I know clearly what it is about. Obviously, grandma, people that I love, I really my just I have a picture of my team and how it's gonna look, how like what my box is gonna look like, players' box, and I really want to play for them in a way, you know, in, in a good way. Like they drive me. The love for those people, love. For, for myself as a tennis player as well, love for the sport, for those people, this is what drives me. Love for, for yeah, for for the life in a way, you know, not not the results, you know, like, yes, great, I want to win, I want to win, but that love, that's that's the most important thing. Yeah. Are we going to be in your box? Sure, yeah, 100%. <laughs> sure. I, I always imagined this guy being in the box, and yeah. he said... Steven's now, Steven's now linking yeah. arms with me, yeah, he's yeah, like, hey, yeah, you got another one. Yeah, you got another yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, this guy for sure. And you have to earn it. You have to still earn it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. No, but um, no, uh, amazing. I mean, I think it's so, it's incredible to see that, you know, you went from someone who was so focused on you. you it's literally, it's like night and day. Yeah. It's really like night and day because you were someone who was extremely focused on results and the, like you said, perfectionist, things like that. Um, yeah. To now it's it's almost like, there's a clarity, yeah. um, which as a friend, like no, b tennis aside, yeah. everything as a friend, yeah. it's incredible to see yeah. uh, because it's, you know, it just, it, it's incredible growth. Yeah. And it's like, it, it really feels like, you know, 100%. It, yeah. it, it feels you. like you're Thank a rocket you. taken off. And that's how I feel. I truly feel yeah. uh, Clear, completely yeah. unstoppable mentally. Like it's like, you, you can't touch me. No matter what happens, I know how to deal Bulletproof. with it. Bulletproof. Uh, yeah. 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 A bulletproof and... Again, it just it's it's hard to believe. It's like I'm I'm in a dream in a way, but it's, I don't lose the sense of reality. I still stay humble. I understand that I'm very very far, but it's like 
my mind it's it's limit the power of my mind is limitless like i can i can get myself where where wherever i want to get you know i just need to focus on myself compare myself to myself not to others and just every day try to be a little better version of myself just by focusing on little things every yeah. single day and if i do that no matter if i become number one or or win slams or olympic games i'll just keep going because even as the number one it doesn't mean that you're the best version of yourself you still can can grow and it's that unconditional love for, for yeah. sport, not yeah. not for the results. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know what this reminds me of? Just me thinking mm-hmm. about it. like, you know, like those like Conor McGregor uh, motivational videos, mm-hmm. and it always starts with him like at 16 years old, yeah. and he's like, "I'm the f- future," and the, he, yeah. and he's like, "Listen, guys, I'm a double champ already. Yeah. Like, you have no idea. Like, this is kind of what it reminds me of in the sense yeah. of like, yeah. you know, it, when you when you see like actual belief." Like yeah. when, you, when you, you feel actual belief when you, when it's there, yeah. you know, and it's, no, I truly people, believe. I people truly are believe, able yeah. to say a lot of things, but not yeah. everyone's able to believe, but it, but truly you clearly believe, believe, believe and, yeah. and that's the most powerful thing. And, that's and I don't the, think anybody's gotten there that didn't believe, you know? Yeah. They have to, you have to, you have to, that's yeah. like a, that's a necessary 100%, ingredient. 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, yeah. No, listen, but. Do you want to cut here or? Or I want some. Fi- I want I, some, no, something I d- that, you, that our audience can take away. If if, if you know, L- so last message, podcast. last message, right? Yeah. Okay. The, let's yeah. I'll let's let's take it home. No, I mean, it, 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 yeah. we're we're at no time limit. Uh, yeah. uh, seriously. So whatever, whatever you want. What's the yeah, la- last message? Positive message. I've uh, again. I've been trying to discover myself as a person. Been thinking a lot about meaning of life and all of that. And lately, I've been talking to my parents. I'm like. I think I figured out life. I, I, I realized what life is about. Like, I, I know the meaning of life. Like, like let, let, me, let me tell it to you. And I've been telling it to my parents and they're like, it actually kind of makes sense. And so I want to I wanna share it with everyone because I believe that it can make, it definitely helped me change my life completely. And I feel like it can help people as well. Um, I was thinking that what drives people? What drives people? And we had a conversation actually with Dima a few years back. We were in Pennsylvania and he was like, Alex, what do you want from life? What do you want from life? And I told him, I, I want to be happy. And he's like, but everyone wants to be happy, you know? <laughs> uh, what do you want from life? I'm like, I don't know, maybe play tennis, maybe become an investment banker. But that was the answer. That was the answer. And I'll, I'll come back to that, to that actually. So I was thinking, what drives people? A lot of times it's money or fame or power, you know? Those are like the common things. But then we know a lot of super wealthy people that are completely unhappy, even kill themselves. Famous people kill, kill themselves. Power, uh, I'm not sure about suicides, but but they're not happy, you know? So what what is it that that makes us happy? What can give us happiness? And I was like, what what is the feeling that is, goes hand in hand with happiness? Any guesses? I know you, I know I mean, you, we've t- we, you know. We've, we've discussed this, so I'm not going to say, but. Yeah, so I, I thought love, love is just, we all, or most of us have people that we love, right? And love for, for those people that make us do good things. And now someone can say, but there's like love-hate relationships. But again, the bad things that you do, it's hate makes you do those things or not acceptance that something happened. But love only makes you do good things, love for people. But again, you're not with people all the time. You don't feel it all the time. You don't feel that happiness, love all the time. Now, what else? The love for, for the thing that you do, like some... It doesn't have to be something big. Like for me, tennis is huge. Like I have big aspirations. It can be small, but we all loved doing something at a certain point. Like you guys love doing that podcast right now, right? And you you don't necessarily do it for, for some external rewards, even though you want to get them, but you just love doing that, right? And it gives you pleasure. You, you feel happy doing that. Mm. But again, you don't do it 24-7. You, you I, right now, like I, I love playing tennis, but I don't play tennis all the time. I feel happy when I play tennis. I feel happy when I spend time with people that I love. And again, how, how do you get it 24 seven, you know? And it's impossible. First of all, it's impossible to get 24 seven, but very close. So that's how I, I feel right now. Almost 24 seven happiness. And I was like, how do you get there? And I realized that you got to just love yourself. You got to love yourself. You got to accept yourself for who you are with all of your imperfections. Because no one is perfect. All of us have some weakness, weaknesses. We all yeah. can grow and learn. You got to accept yourself. But what I mean by that, it's not like, oh, I'm okay where I am and I don't do anything. No, not that. Not that. 
you accept yourself. You're like, that's where I am. This is who I am. You're being very honest with yourself. You criticize yourself, but constructively, constructively, what can I do better? And you go from there. You, you, you're like, I'm, I love myself. That, that's who I am. And you go from there and you learn because you have yourself from the very first to the, to the last day of your life. That's guaranteed. You're always with yourself. You talk about this idea that you, like, yeah. you might as well be your best friend. Exactly. But own, best yeah. friend, you need to be your best friend. Absolutely. Like no destructive criticism. There is no place. Why? Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you give yourself crap? You really don't need that at all. And now being your best friend is not easy. Comple like truly best friend where you don't give yourself it's not easy. But again, those tools have helped me understand who I am, understand my feelings and really helped me love myself in the, in the best way. And it's again, yeah. not that I'm the best. No, 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 not at all. I'm very realistic about myself, but I'm good with what I am. I'm good with my English not being perfect. I'm good with not being the smartest. I'm good with not being the best necessarily player in the world right now. I'm good. I can grow. I can get better every single day. And so again, it might feel or sound you know, utopian in a way that like you feel happy 24 7 but that's how i feel almost like that I, obviously i experience some negative emotions still but i know how to deal with those things they're very short-lived you know very short-lived i realize right away why i experience that negative emotion again if it's uncontrollable can't do anything about it accept accept controllable what can i do about it and do right away do something do as much as i can and if it doesn't happen doesn't happen but at least i've, I've done something and that emotion goes away and so i think Again, it might not work for everyone, but I think it kind of makes sense. And it truly has been working incredibly, incredibly well for me. Well, I think it's a very like, I think, you know, I feel like a lot of people know that, but they don't really do it Practice and understand it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, they're like, hard, yeah, like, I obviously said. you should love yourself, but it's like, no, but if, if, yeah, if it's just one thing to say it, but another thing to do it. Yeah, just do it is extremely look, difficult. Look, look at your body. Look how you talk to yourself. Just, just listen to yourself sometimes because everyone does that. I do it sometimes too, right now, even now, but way, way less. I've gave myself too much crap throughout my life. I saw myself for, for all the negative things and didn't really see myself for the good qualities, which that I had, which I have good qualities for sure. You know, yeah. like I, I was raised well, I believe, and, and I have good qualities, but I never really saw myself for them. And so, yes, it sounds simple, maybe even romantic in a way that love, that that's what should drive people or that's what drives me. But it makes sense at the same time. And it, as you said, as I said, it's not easy to be your best friend, not at all. But again, those tools, the top, top mindset, that, that's what truly got me there to understanding that, that thing. And, and understanding my emotions, understanding who I am as a person and just finding myself in a way. That's who I am. That's it. Looking at myself in the mirror. That's who I am. And, and I'm not perfect. And that's totally fine. I love myself still. I truly love myself and I'm my best friend. And this is really something that made, made a change for me, made a big difference. But again, you can't just do it like that. You have to have you the can't tools do it. to. Exactly. You can't do it like that. You have to understand yourself better. You have to, and to be able to understand, True, I swear those tools have been helping me. I believe they can help anyone because they make you think who you are, what you want, what you want. And so, yeah. So if this doesn't convince you to look into tap and yeah. to start using these tools, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what will. And, and truly, like it's not promoting tap, really. I just, I truly feel like it can help people. It can help people. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Know? So. Definitely. And there's also another uh, uh, really important key to life that I think. Uh, uh, which is uh, subscribing to Just Lap Tennis. Uh, 100%. 100%. You, you that's, I mean, listen. Because that will also very much help your life. <laughs> that, that, that's for sure. Um, 100%. No, but in all seriousness, man, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It was, it was awesome. I mean, you, we really talked about a lot of things. And we, we did. It, it's usually when we cover like this wide breadth of topics, we don't really, I feel like, sometimes go deep enough. And I feel like today we... Uh, I think we, yeah. today we, was great. We definitely did. So Thank you so much, guys, for, for thank having you, me. Seriously, Seriously. It's, it's been fun. It's been great. Never had I ever experienced so much joy and fun being in, fro in front of three cameras. <laughs> yeah. I've always been afraid of cameras, and uh, today was awesome. That's awesome. So and much. now you're gonna have the whole Just Laugh family supporting you, watching you uh, on your on your. That's uh, all I need. Conquest to uh, to world number one and uh, Olympic gold. And so. next time, next time we do this thing, we'll be you'll be Grand Slam champ, yeah, Olympic if you, champ. If you know. you're not. Number one in the world, an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. You're not coming on this podcast. <laughs> again. All right, that's it. I won't be here. That's yeah, it. that's good.
<laughs> but, the deal. but once I come back, I told you guys, I'll be, I yeah. told you, I told you. I told you. And then I it's going to be you. like, listen, and guys. And then tap stock goes. Yeah, yeah. tap, tap stock, stock just skyrockets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, coming, I'm no. coming. That's awesome. Yeah. But no, uh, guys, if you enjoyed the podcast, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, share it with your friends that uh, might need to hear this message. And uh, stay healthy, stay happy. And as always, just laugh. Take care. Just laugh.